Hey, welcome to the first episode of Perceived Visions, a review series for movies and television shows, with a particular emphasis on animation. Uh, but I will occasionally cover live action also. For the first three episodes, I decided the good, the bad, and the ugly. These will cover my current favorite, ironic favorite, and worst films. So the one I like the most, the one I find the most ironically enjoyable, and the one that's just unapologetically most terrible. With that being said, of course, we can now kick off with my most favorite film at the moment, Perfect Blue. In March of 1991, Yoshikazu Takeuchi's novel, Perfect Blue, Complete Metamorphosis, was released in Japan. It received decent enough claim to be approved for a live-action direct-to-video series adaption. This plan changed after the Kobe earthquake of 1995 destroyed most of the production studio. With the budget sliced, the adaption would now be an animated film with the production value of an original video animation. Anime fans abbreviate this format as an OVA, which is Japan's equivalent of a straight-to-video movie. To direct Perfect Blue, Satoshi Kon was hired. Up to this point, Kon had been a successful writer and animator, but had no directed films under his belt. Perfect Blue was his debut film releasing in 1997. This was the beginning of a fantastic streak for Cohen, who, in the span of his short career, directed four films and one television series, all well received by animation fans around the world. His work was also very inspiring to America, as the 2010 film Black Swan carries many parallels with Perfect Blue, and Cohen's 2006 film Paprika was one of the main influences for Inception. Perfect Blue is a psychological horror film focusing on Mima Kiragoi, a member of the J-pop group Cham, as she decides to leave the music scene and become an actress. As Mima is making the transition, however, some of her old fans give backlash to her changing career. She soon realizes someone is stalking her, and people working on her new show are being murdered, causing her to lose sense of the world and what is real. While an animated horror film may sound bizarre at first, it does make sense. With animation, any shot, bloody scene, or monster can occur in exactly the way you want it. But because horror is generally on the cheaper side when it comes to budget, and animation is still considered a kid's thing, not many exist. One big thing to note about animation is how crazy or pleasing to the eye you can make it. Every frame is not bound by the limits of reality, making squash and stretch, exaggerated reactions, and very good looking characters very tempting. Cohn took note of this and made Perfect Blue much more restrained. Apart from the pop stars and actors that are supposed to be looking good, no character has the stereotypical big eyes of anime. The public look like standard Japanese locals. Actions are very natural and realistic, keeping the film grounded. This aids the film in two ways. It makes the murders and violent moments much more shocking, and it makes the later blurring of reality that much more potent. So, don't automatically denounce this film for being animated. I've definitely seen goofier American live-action horror that wishes I could take it even remotely as seriously. One of the finer, subtle details is the coloration of the film. As it begins, the backgrounds during Mima's conversations have light hues, colors that feel non-intrusive and tame. As Mima's sense of reality is slowly lost, those hues become much deeper and in your face. The main color choice in Perfect Blue is not, of course, blue, but red. The bold red constantly occupies the film, especially in the most gruesome of moments. The film contains plenty of dark content. Without spoilers, the film has plenty of blood, sexual moments, and violence. To be fair, no actual sex occurs, and the sexual parts are required for the plot and Mima's character arc. The bloody scenes occur in spurts, but are a limited part of the film, like any good horror should be in my opinion. Just know that the film is rated R for a reason and the original cut is a bit farther from R. I would keep the viewer age above 18, personally, but don't expect the film to be gore and sex just for the sake of it, because it's handled really well. Like the rest of Cone's work, the film has a heavy emphasis on duality. While the film blurs the lines of reality and fiction, the actual dichotomy in question is between Mima's celebrity personality and who she actually is as a person. The film highlights this as soon as it begins, the first scene splits between Mima performing in front of an audience, while the other is Mima doing simple chores, like getting groceries and riding the subway. 
where her subtle nuances reveal her natural tendencies. For a real-life example, think about Elvis Presley. There are a whole lot of distinct characteristics we naturally place on that name. But who is he when the show is over? Behind all the extravagance of the stage, Elvis is a person like you and me. But you don't see everyone praising the guy for brushing his teeth. Fans put his celebrity personality on a pedestal. And that separation is what makes Perfect Blue so interesting. When the celebrity personality starts to dictate everything you are in the eyes of millions, and no one really knows who you are. As the film continues, Mima starts seeing her old pop persona interacting with the world instead of her. That loss of identity steadily breaks her. After all, every person needs their identity to survive. Perfect Blue has a unique trait where its main theme has actually grown more prevalent over time. In the late 90s, the internet was just starting. Heck, Mima has to learn how to work a Macintosh within the film. The theme of celebrity personality only applied to actual stars and very famous people. But now, in the tail end of the 2010s, everybody performs to the world, especially children. Social media gives everybody the opportunity to create an avatar. A teenager can post the most highly edited and precise photos just to make their followers believe in a very specific version of them. Every person is pandering and creating a specific personality to the world, and Perfect Blue can now easily prey on that fact. If you wish to delve into this theme further, Super Eye Patch Wolf made an excellent video titled Why Perfect Blue is Terrifying. I highly recommend it even if you're remotely interested. The editing on this film is fantastic. Satoshi Kon rivals Edgar Wright in many regards when it comes to the transition of scenes. Kon's edits here can be extremely clever and constantly keeps you on your toes. Because the film only has an 81 minute runtime, the edits also help deliver necessary information at a faster rate. There's no overly long exposition here, and you can thank the editing for that. The pinnacle of this editing is during the third quarter of the film, where the scenes start bleeding into each other. While some people have opposed this tactic of confusing the viewer, it works brilliantly within the film's context. Just like how Mima no longer understands what is real, the viewer is on the same boat, making it much more engaging. Horror can be easy to watch passively and without immersion, but the cuts of Perfect Blue force you to pay attention and be part of the experience. When it comes to the plot itself, it's not the most complicated thing I've seen, but it packs a lot into 81 minutes. There are many twists of varying quality, but I found the main one to work great. The twists really encourage multiple viewings to catch the details hidden behind the knowledge of the full timeline. The simple city and studio atmosphere serve to heighten the realistic murder story, and the film even has a whole other show within it, the crime drama series Double Bind. It runs like your standard Criminal Minds type show, but the addition is great nonetheless, and adds even a few more twists to the main story. One big choice of consuming foreign media is the sub versus dub argument. This is the decision between subtitles or actors dubbing the translated script over the film. For me, I found the perfect blue dub acceptable. Junko Iwao's voice was a bit too high for a 20-ish Mima in my opinion. But besides the lead actress, both versions are on even grounds for me, so pick whichever you want. With so many films in the world, picking a favorite can be quite difficult. Most of my favorite things have a very big emotional or nostalgic attachment on them. Perfect Blue was my rare exception. I watched it at the age of 18 for the first time, a point far beyond potential for childhood endearment. While there are many bigger and bolder films out in the world, Perfect Blue's easy to absorb runtime, restrained yet excellent art direction, and execution of its themes have strangely dazzled me. It is one out of a very small list of films where my first thought was, man, I want to watch that again immediately. For me, I give Perfect Blue a 10 out of 10. For Americans who wish to see it, there is some bad news, however. While the UK has had Perfect Blue on Blu-ray since 2013, America hasn't seen any home release since the DVD release in 2000. I'm the only person I know of who owns this version, and it doesn't even fill up modern TV sets. Besides a limited screening in 2018, America hasn't seen any Perfect Blue, and I suppose never will. Oh, wait. Are you serious? Is that? Yep. America's Blu-ray will drop March 26, 2019. 
Hopefully a new generation will get the same memorable experience I did.